What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 100 episodes recorded with those very executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, Cigna, and Google, the answer is clear. They learned lessons in leadership from the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. Some of our guests' athletic experience earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claimed they were terrible in their sport. But no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them lessons they still use as leaders today. In partnership with Maxwell Leadership, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all-access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful, positive change in your own organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is the owner of the Savannah Bananas and founder of Fans First Entertainment, Jesse Cole. In two and a half years of recording the Corporate Competitor Podcast and these amazing interviews, he is our first repeat guest. See, Jesse and I are preparing for the release of the book we worked on together, Banana Ball, the unbelievably true story of the Savannah Bananas. Whether at the ballpark, on social media, on stage delivering keynotes, or in features for ESPN and Entrepreneur, Jesse continues to create fans all over the world. The Bananas have sold out every game since their first season and have a wait list for tickets that is in the tens of thousands. They have entertained millions of fans in Savannah and at ballparks all over the country on their Banana Ball Tour. Jesse is the proud inventor of the game we call Banana Ball. And he's the not-so-proud promoter of the human horse race and Flatulence Fun Night. He's a raving fan of his wife, Emily, his amazing children, and peerless promoters like Walt Disney, P.T. Barnum, and Bill Vack. Remember to visit corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash 144 and download the notes and reflection questions we put together for you. Every day, do a friction audit on your entire experience. Put yourself in the customer's shoes. If you're a brick and mortar, driving up. What's the parking lot? Is there any friction there? Is there trash on the ground? How easily can you get into your store? How are you greeted when you walk in? There's friction almost every step of the way. And I believe that is the starting point for all innovation to creating fandom every single day. Jesse, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Always fired up to be back with you, my friend. You know, you're our first ever repeat guest for a really special reason. It's because you and I are preparing to release the book we worked on together, Banana Ball, the unbelievable true story of the Savannah Bananas. When we last spoke on this podcast, you were thinking about a little world tour, Seven Cities in 2022, which was kind of the basis for our book, this idea of taking what you've created to the world. And the timing couldn't be better because your 33-city world tour is underway. You're playing to sellouts every night. What were the business lessons and takeaways from that first world tour that gave you the confidence that this was ready to go bigger? Well, I think it all started from that one city world tour. The year before that. Yeah, I think everything we do is an experiment. You test things and you try things and you see, but if you have a clear vision of what you're trying to do, it makes it easier. I've been so inspired by Walt Disney and his clear vision of what he wanted to create. So a vision for Banana Ball was to create a game that was fun, nonstop entertainment, and that we would love, that anybody, not just your baseball purist, you know, as someone who only sold two tickets when we first came to Savannah, and my wife and I were down to our last dollar, sleeping on an airbed seven years ago, we knew we had to do something dramatically different. We just looked at what are all those friction points, what are all those frustration points in a regular baseball game to create something that could be magical. And we think Banana Ball is the ultimate two-hour time game, and no bunting. If you bunch, you're thrown out of the game. Batters can steal first. And the most fans first rule, if a fan catches a foul ball, it's an out. 
we tested it, we tried it, and we learn more every single day. And you know, our ethos and our vision is everything we do is fans first. It drives our business. It's who we are. We are a fan. We want to be a bigger fan every day. So what are we doing to create that fandom? And we love seeing people all over the world coming to watch this little game that a small team from Savannah, Georgia created. It's mind blowing. It's not an overstatement to say people from all over the world. I remember while we were working on the book, one of the nights I was there with you in Savannah, I happened upon fans who had flown in from Germany <laughs> to watch this game literally was the reason they were in Savannah, Georgia. It's got to be inspiring for you. Yeah, it's to see where we've gone again. There was just four of us that started in this old ballpark where the phone lines were cut and there was nothing left to now. Yeah, doing 33 cities and hearing from major league teams about playing at their venue. It's crazy, but you know, it was never the goal, Don. We never think about how big it's getting. We're blown away. I mean, the wait list just passed 600,000 for tickets, Don, which doesn't make any sense to me. It was so much bigger than baseball. At the heart of it, I'm still just a kid trying to make my dad proud and trying to create something that he would look at and say, wow, Jesse, you've created something that's really made an impact. As an only child with parents divorced and you know a dad that raised me in that love of baseball, I'm trying to create that love from him, from everyone else, and give that love back to people and bring people together and have fun. And at the end of every night to see everyone singing, dancing, all the players, the cast, and our dancing umpire and our male cheerleading team all out in the plaza having fun with our fans. It doesn't matter what time it is. It just continues. That's to me the greatest joy. I don't know if you'll remember it, but you and I were in the bowels of the stadium in Montgomery, Alabama, doing an interview for this book. We were talking to publishers yeah. and I mentioned to you that I had seen just a game previously, your father standing next to you as he was watching fans come to you and you got a little teary eyed, <laughs> just a kid trying to make his dad proud. Yeah. One of the things that I don't guess most fans know is that at the end of every game, if your father's not present, what do you do? I call him. He watches every single game from when I was a kid to when I played baseball at Wofford College. My dad would fly down and see the games. Now it's so much bigger because, you know, he can watch a full broadcast with drone cameras and 10 different camera sets and watch at a whole nother level. And he sees everything. And yeah, he's the first person I call because, um, He's seen really where it's come from. He's seen this game. He helped create some of the rules in this game. You talked about it in the book about feel the dreams and why it made such an impact. That one simple line, dad, you want to play catch? Mm -hmm. We all have a connection with a family member. It could be a mother, it could be a dad. For me, it was baseball that brought us together. And then the game that I saw started changing, getting longer, getting slower, not connecting with kids as much. And my kids now, you know, I have two four-year-olds about to turn five and Maverick, my biological son, watches every single banana ball game. He said, dad, you scored two runs. I score one run. I get the point. The party animals get the point. <laughs> he's a party animal fan, which is a whole nother story. Maverick is a party animal. Oh, he's obsessed with the party animals. But what's crazy is he's growing up learning banana ball, not baseball. In the mornings before I go to the ballpark, me and Maverick go outside and we play banana ball with banana ball rules with the walks counting his sprints and he acts out every single player imitating every player which i used to do as a kid with ken grippy jr and hideo nomo and nomar garcia Perra. of course my dad's a big part of it but now i'm seeing it with my kids and it's really special the greatest creators the greatest innovators create something that they would love that they would be a fan of walt disney said it on his park bench watching his two daughters on the carousel he said, I wish there was a place that adults and kids could have fun together. He created Disneyland as much for himself. I'm just creating something that me and my dad had. That love of baseball, every day getting home from work at six o'clock, us going in the backyard and playing catch. It means more than I think I can even share at this point. Gosh, I love it. That's so cool. The Bananas 33 City Tour, you're playing in 10 AAA ballparks, six AA parks, six single A parks, and four spring training ballparks. We all want growth. Yeah. And I know you're never one to put limits on anything, but yeah. what's the big vision that you have for banana ball? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was a kid. I got to be bat boy for the Red Sox for a day. I got to pitch at Fenway Park. You were a college all-star yes. out there competitively pitching at Fenway. Oh, yeah. Most adrenaline you could ever imagine pitching on Fenway Mound where Pedro Martinez pitched and Roger Clemens pitched. You better believe it. As th this is taken to the next level and we're selling out major league spring training homes and AAA parks and the wait list has crawled over 600,000. Could we take it to a major league park? I've had that vision of Fenway Park and 
walking out in the field with my dad and saying, look at what we did. And we're so fortunate that the Red Sox have reached out. But in addition to the Red Sox, we've now heard from 18 major league teams. They reach out and say, what's it going to take to have the Bananas play at our stadium? Can we be the first? Could we be the biggest? Could we be this? We were just a team playing in the small 1926 ballpark, and they want us to come out and sell out their stadium with a special event of banana ball. A professional league in Japan reached out about us doing a Japan tour. Have cruise ships reached out about us doing bananas cruises. Have all these international opportunities I never imagined happen. But that was never the goal. The growth is a byproduct. The goal is just to first get off that airbed and create a product that people would actually love. And now, unbelievable what's happening. And there's a bigger vision, too. I think a lot of people may just see the individual chess moves. But if you see the whole chessboard, it's not just the Savannah Bananas. We're trying to build something bigger, Banana Ball, because we believe this game is really special. And we're going to spread that, hopefully, all over in the years to come. The vision was clear, and the growth is a byproduct. How important, how integral is that idea of having a vision that doesn't necessarily say, I have to grow, in the message you would want to give business leaders about how to think their way to a greater future. A hundred percent. I mean, growth is only inspiring in doses. Once you start reaching certain levels of revenue, sales, it's only in doses for people. People are really inspired by why they do what they do, the experience they're trying to create, and the purpose that they get from it. The fans' first moments, you know, these special stories, Don, it's crazy what's already happened on this tour because that's all we talk about. We come to a city, we bring the whole staff together and said, all right, share a story from last weekend. And then we say, what's the fans' first moment you guys are going to create this weekend? Let's talk about that. Every member on the staff is empowered to create that because creating that type of experience can make an impact on you personally. Everyone's like, are you B2C? Are you B2B? No, we're H to H. We're human to human. Right. It's the vision to do something bigger than yourself. Growth is a byproduct. The sales are a byproduct. Everything that we focus on is not about customers, not about growing customers, chasing customers. It's about creating fans. First, you got to create a fan of yourself and believe in what you do as the leader. Then you got to create fans of everyone on your team, the biggest fans. And if they really love what they do, they will create fans of everyone else. Hey, develop a business model that everything you do is to create fans of the experience you're trying to create, the product you're trying to create. We're sports guys. There's a lot of sports in this podcast. And fans can be a loose term, like I'm a fan. But if every business started talking with that terminology and say, is that how you would treat a fan? Is that what you would do for a fan? Instead of a customer. Instead of a customer, yeah. Then all of a sudden, it really sets a great direction for your business. And that's really been the ethos of everything we do. You have this foundational question that I know has been a real play for you for a long time. Why do so many businesses continually do things that their customers hate? Well, I think the reality is that it's just part of your business. Tickets. You buy a ticket to any type of experience. You pay a ticket fee, a service fee, a convenient fee, which is the most inconvenient fee in the world. Then you pay your taxes and a $40 ticket is $58.25 if you're lucky. You buy merchandise anywhere. You pay the shipping fee. Then you pay the taxes. And all of a sudden, I was like, what is happening? Everyone does it. Just the normal part of the process. That's not fans first. People don't like that. So yeah, we got a little of all ticket fees, service fees, convenient fees. We actually pay the taxes for everyone, which no one realizes. Like a $25 ticket, we pay all your taxes. You buy a beer at the stadium, we pay all your taxes. We ship everything for free. We throw a free koozie. We throw a free decal. It's part of our whole model. And I think you look at that and it's like, oh, if we add this little add-on, when I go, you know, the Mexican restaurants, you know, I'm not going to give any names, the extra $2 for guac, putting something in your experience, the extra guac experience, you're excited and it's like, oh, fine, I'll pay the extra $2. It doesn't add. Make your burrito, instead of $9, make it $10 and just make it all inclusive. It's a very simple model, but we always try to add that little extra that we think will drive revenue and sales. And it does. It often does. But as a business owner, business leader, you need to be a friction fighter. Put yourself in the customer's shoes and constantly every day do a friction audit on your entire experience. Go through it. If you're a brick and mortar, driving up, What's the parking lot? Is there any friction there? Is there trash on the ground? How easily can you get into your store? How are you greeted when you walk in? If you're outside when you call, is it the generic voicemail like everyone else? Please listen closely as our menu options have changed. Get rid of that. <laughs> Make it fun. What is your hold music? There's friction almost every step of the way. And I believe that is the starting point for all innovation to creating fandom every single day. Mm, powerful. Every night at our ballpark, we're doing 10 to 15 things we've never done before. I think I've shown you a script and it's all the green things that aren't quite right. 
Yes, the living pinata <laughs> didn't work out well. Well, messy baby, the horse head race. There's so many that just don't work. As Henry Ford said, learn by doing. So powerful. We do friction audits all the time because we're doing more. We're testing more. We're experimenting more. What people don't realize about our process, it's a whole week of come up with ideas in our OTC session. Then we do a table read. Then we do rehearsals. Then we do rehearsals in front of people. And you've watched this in the VIB. Very important banana. Right. Everyone that comes in their VIB, I'm not necessarily watching the players do their dance on the field or the hitting entrance or the crazy scoring celebration. I'm watching the audience. Are they into it? Are they filming it? Are they fully committed to this? They love it. Are they laughing? Based on that, we make the decision whether we're going to do it or not. That's the friction audit. It's the coolest. You know, we're crazy. And we went through this journey together. And you know that banana ball was created because we saw that baseball was too long, too slow, too boring. We didn't do surveys for our fans saying, what do you think about baseball? We started taking pictures of our fans coming into our ballpark, the entire grandstand, when they got up, when they left, and when they left for the night. We realized at about 9 o'clock, 20 to 30%, two hours in the game, we're leaving. Then another 10% at 930, then another 10%, and you had half the crowd for a typical three-hour baseball game. Then we said, we're going to make a two-hour time limit, and we're going to do everything we can to make the game faster and exciting so you don't even want to get out of your seat. Stop doing what your customers hate. It sounds so obvious, but it's actually the simplest way to create a great fans first experience and to innovate with your business. Isn't it crazy, though, that some of the most amazing things and lessons we should learn are the ones that seem the simplest? <laughs> it's funny because we don't set out to do something our customers hate. We just seem to do them and then we kind of expect everybody to abide them. Yeah. So how often as as leaders are we just focusing on the business strategy, the business plan, but are we actually in there watching our customer come in and figure out how to buy? Where do I go with this? And what's taking long? And how come we're having problems with our contact forms and we're getting the same questions over and over again? Then there's a problem in the root of it. All those questions you've taught our team to really focus on on a daily basis. You also do these really amazing things that you as a team have to do right after every game. The players actually are out there helping clean the field and get it right. And then you gather everybody, players, your staff, and you all do an immediate audit. What worked, what didn't. And they tell stories which are inspiring to the other people that get them fired up to come to work the next day. Every company in the world has core beliefs or core values, but do you have stories that back them up? Stories is everything for us. That's what we share with our players. The first time that Brian Encarnacion, a temporary player with us just for a few days, and two kids came up to him and asked him for his autograph. I watched and walked by as he said, no. I was like, what? And then he got down to his knee and said, only if I can have yours first. Boy. And he handed the kid his hat and they signed his hat. Now, if you look at our team, it blows my mind. One of the first stops on our tour, there was this long line that went for like, I don't know, it looked like 50 kids. Who's getting all these autographs? Like, who do they love this much? It was Michael Deeb. I'm like, oh, and I got closer. And I realized that the kids were lined up to sign his jersey. His entire jersey filled with autographs from kids. That story lived on throughout our team until about a month ago. You don't even know this. I got a call from the National Baseball Hall of Fame, and they asked to put Michael Deeb's signed jersey in the Hall of Fame. No way. It's going to be in the Hall of Fame. It's going to be in the Hall of Fame and exhibit with, you know, there's going to be our yellow banana ball, the top hat, a lot of things, but they wanted that jersey. It wasn't because of something he did on the field. It was something he did for fans. Of all our players, he's going to have his jersey in the Hall of Fame. And that story lives on. We talk about those moments and experiences to understand that, hey, guys, it's not just the normal job that you do. It's how you make people feel. And there's those little examples. Think differently about what everyone else is doing and try something new. And you never know. You could be in the Hall of Fame. Wow. Try something new and you never know. You could end up in the Hall of Fame. That'll stick with me for quite some time. <laughs> so one thing that stood out and that many people might not know You've taken all the advertisements and sponsorships out of the stadium in Savannah. You mentioned the price of your home game tickets yeah. down in that $20, $25 range, even though they often resell for hundreds or even thousands of dollars in the secondary market, and you don't get a dime of that. Yeah, Most business folks are looking and going, look at all that money he's leaving on the table. Why would he do that? Why are you not maximizing? I mean, you have a profit center that could just be feeding all kinds of families and you're letting that go. Why is that? 
if you break it down, because I'm more focused on long-term fans than short-term profits. Mm. When you're building a business, it's not just about how do you maximize the dollars. On February 25th, 2020, we announced that we were eliminating all the advertising from our stadium. We realized that that wasn't fans first. I don't believe anybody comes to our ballpark to be sold to, marketed to, or advertised to. They come to have a great experience with their family, with their friends, and escape into a place of joy and fun. So if you have someone else's agenda, trying to sell cars, or you name it, real estate, whatever that is, how does that help add to a fans first experience? Again, two weeks before the pandemic hit, we said, let's throw away hundreds of thousands of dollars before our bottom line. Don, no one in the industry has copied us on that. Right. You have to be able to say no to a lot of other opportunities, a lot of other things, if you want to create those long-term fans. You know, we're fortunate. The business model, it works. We have our fans supporting us in more ways than we ever imagined because of that narrow focus, doing something that we believe we can be the best in and that our fans expect from us, not us trying just to utilize our sponsorship or do extra events. Hey, we'll sell this to our fans. We'll sell this to our fans. We spend zero dollars on advertising, zero dollars on marketing. We invest everything in the experience to create those fans who then do the best form of marketing there is, which is word of mouth marketing. So we're proud of going all in on doing what we believe we can be the best in the world at, and that's create the greatest show in sports and the best possible fan experience. If you're willing to say short term, it might hurt a little bit. You got to get through the messy to get to the great. Long term, see what happens because it can be more fun for your team, more purpose, and the revenue will follow. You have to get through the messy to get to the great. Give me a messy that led you to a great. Oh, geez. Uh, the first game when we were playing in green uniforms because we weren't quite right, we made actually six errors and played terrible. But that wasn't the real messy part. The messy part was the first ever night trying to figure out how to serve all you can eat to 4,000 fans. There's no blueprint. There's no playbook on how to do this because no one was doing it. No, you make extra money by selling a burger for $7, a drink for $5. You don't give it away for free. That doesn't make sense. No, it's a better fan experience because a friction point, taking out a credit card out of your pocket and paying throughout a night is a friction point. If your son wants a drink, oh, here, take the money. Daughter wants a soda, take your money. That's a friction point. So we eliminate it. That first night, the lines, and this is no joke, took two plus hours. People couldn't get food because we didn't know we were going to go through 10,000 pieces of meat in an hour. How do you know that? Is that what you ended up with? 10,000 pieces of meat in an hour. Wow. We had all the burgers, the hot dogs, the chicken sandwiches. They were all the first thing. So people just put them all in their arms. Right. Yeah. And now we don't go through that much with the same crowd because the next game we put the drinks first. So you put a drink in your hand and then you could probably grab one burger, one dog. That simple adjustment made a big difference. Then stanchions, another station made it easier. So people, when they come in, they're like, I got to grab food for the whole night. Same thing developing banana ball. I mean, the first game, some of the rules were crazy. They weren't working. The showdowns, the first world tour in Mobile, I'll never forget, we were having the national anthem. And the lines to get in Dawn were so long that the national anthem singer, who was like a top five contestant on The Voice, couldn't make it. We literally had no anthem singer right before the game because we're playing in a different market. We don't have the easy connection. Like we're trying to make it happen. All of a sudden, I go to our announcer, Shark, who can sing a little bit. Can you just leave the audience and sing? And he's like, oh, oh, oh okay, all right. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Take me out to the shark national anthem. He goes, I'm so sorry. Everyone started laughing. They thought we did it on purpose. No, that was a complete mess up. And then the sound went out later the next inning. And there were so many of these things that we learned and we got better and better and better at. All these different changes and the iteration, the iteration, the iteration. Henry believed in learning by doing. So every day getting through that messy, that's what really makes the journey worth it because you learn these things and you realize how far you've come to now where we are and playing at sold out stadiums and potentially major league stadiums. It makes it realize that it was all worth it. Get through the messy to get to the great. I love it. <laughs> you guys are famous for your crazy ideas. Batter going to the plate with a flaming bat. I was there that night. That was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Pitcher on stilts, dancing umpire. One of the coolest dudes you all have. You're clearly not afraid to try things. So now we're keeping track of trick plays. Our center fielders doing backflips while catching the balls. They're catching bare hand line drives, balls between the legs. And I tell the guys this all the time. Hey guys, people aren't going to remember if you miss a trick play, but they're never going to forget if you make an amazing trick play. Some stats into the sports and history of baseball. Who has the most hits in Major League Baseball history? Pete Rose. There you go. Pete Rose. Over 4,000 hits. Right. He also had over 14,000 at-bats. Oh. He had 2,000 more at-bats than anybody that ever played the game. 
So of course he had more hits. He kept coming up to bat to get over 4,000 hits. Who failed more than anyone else? Who struck out more than anyone that ever played the game? Very few people know. I would have said maybe Barry Bonds. No, and you don't answer it. I don't want you to answer it because no one ever remembers this. They only know him for his three home runs in game six of the 1977 World Series. Mr. October, he's a Hall of Famer. It's Reggie Jackson. Wow. He struck out more than anyone ever played the game, but he's a Hall of Famer. People aren't going to remember things that don't go wrong. On stage, when I'm giving a keynote, I have a, how many people remember the Amazon Fire phone? No one raises their head. It's hilarious. This was a $170 million failure. It was colossal. But that technology helped build the Amazon Echo and Alexa. Was the Fire phone a failure or was it a huge success? Guys, the only way we're going to continue to innovate is what are we trying more every single day? That's why we force ourselves 10 new things every single game, which is not easy. It may, works our ideal muscle like crazy. We've had a lot of characters that haven't worked. The more you try, the more you do, the more you learn, and the faster you learn, the more you can make a huge impact and grow the business in ways you never imagined. It's funny. You know, I'm in Tallahassee. Yeah. And there was a Florida State University student named Emily Bible who emailed you with this long list of crazy ideas, including a fan wall of fame and stadium musical chairs, which I can't wait to see. Yeah. But the coolest part is that you then recorded a video response to her and you told her, whatever you do, follow your energy, because if you're energized about it, you will do it better than anyone else. Some of the greatest lessons happen at your most challenging points about 10 years ago with our team in Gastonia. It was me and Emily, and we were doing everything. Selling sponsorship, doing the hiring, selling tickets, getting the players, the recruiting. I mean, everything. And me and Emily, were literally, we tackled it all. Every night we'd come home. As much as we loved it, we were just exhausted, just burnt out. And I'd wake up in the mornings, and I would immediately go to email and start focusing on everyone else's priorities as opposed to mine, what gave me energy. I finally said, well, what are the things that fire me up at the end of the day? My best days. Why were they my best days? What was I doing? So what I did is I created my energy list. I put it in buckets of all the things that gave me energy, creating, sharing, and growing. If I'm creating, coming up with new ideas, doing idea sessions, brainstorming sessions with our group, if I'm sharing, speaking with our group, I'm on a podcast like with you right now, I'm on a stage, I'm talking about what fires us up and I'm growing. If I'm listening to podcasts, reading, learning from great entrepreneurs and great visionaries, those give me unbelievable energy. But if I'm focused on spreadsheets and numbers and selling things and operations around the stadium, I am done. Now I set my days to create my energy. And since I've done that and taught that to our team, we have just been thriving because everyone is fired up to do what they're doing. We want more. And we go home to our kids and our families and our friends, and we're just in a great spirit because we're doing what gives energy. It sounds so, again, obvious, but it's hard. You have to have the discipline to say no. Follow your energy. Everyone says, follow your passion. Follow what you love. Now, follow what gives you energy because that will drive everything else. Wow. And we read it. So at the end of the night, when we're all together and talking about our fan service moments and stories, I'm actually scanning the room. Just again, not doing surveys, watching. Are people in? Are they tired? Are they exhausted? And when I see that people, again, finding a friction in our biggest fan experience, I will talk to them and say, hey, what's going on? Well, this happened today. This happened. This happened today. And then, all right, well, let's talk about it. Well, what were the great things? What were the mo- well, amazing things this week that gave you energy? How do we do more of those? And then we start just each day getting better for each person. And you create a culture of environment that you want to keep doing more because you love it. We challenge everyone. We ask them, what's firing you up right now? What's not? And how do we set up a system and a team to do more of that? Don, this was 10 years of getting rejected in sales meetings. Mm-hmm. So when we first started with Gastonia and Savannah, I mean, we got turned down for every sponsorship when we sold it, every single one. And so I could read, I learned how to try to read the room and read what they're saying. When you learn that tool of just getting around, then you can start seeing everyone else and say, all right, something's off right now. Let's go find this. Something's off. And they might not tell that in an email to someone or a message, but each day, if that keeps adding and growing and growing and growing, you're losing a team member that you don't need to lose. If you just follow and focus on what firing them up, what gives them energy and doing more of that. What's firing you up right now and what's not? It's awesome. So the bananas truly become empowered by social media. By the way, Savannah is your social media lead. (laughs) But you have more TikTok followers than any major league team by multiples. Yeah, Your social media has become the top place to promote your brand. What's the key for a business looking to catch up and maybe utilize the power of social for the first time? Two things. What makes you different? What's your guiding force on your social media? What are you doing that's different? And then again, quantity leads to quality. We make baseball fun. 
showing home runs or strikeouts, which there are lots of home runs. There's lots of strikeouts. That's our kind of guidepost on what we share. And I remember Savannah and another intern, I challenged them. I said, guys, post every single day. And they're like, well, we don't have content to post every day. Well, in my belief, constraints foster creativity. So the constraint is that every day you got to find a way to post. And then the more you post, the more we're going to learn. 10 days in and they didn't have anything to post. So literally they got in chicken costumes and went out in the outfield and just started dancing. I talked to them the next day. I go, okay, guys, I appreciate what you're trying to do. Try to stay with the positive. But let me ask you this question. Does two people that no one knows dressed up in chicken costumes make baseball fun? No, probably not. And I go, then that doesn't actually fit with our guidepost. They knew that right there. Hey, keep going, make baseball fun. And now let's learn. Anyone with social media, if you know what makes you different and what your guide is, your North Star, and then you do more, you learn by that. Yeah. You were part of this, the first ever 3 2 2, which is the third inning, the second batter, the second pitch. Right. We said, what if we actually had the pitcher and the infielders do a type of dance or a movement and then throw a pitch? And the first one was literally just them dropping down, just a simple drop. It was not even a dance. But that night we put it out and it got 20 million views. And most importantly, like 100,000, 200,000 shares right away. And I was like, wow, okay, we're onto something. So let's do it again the next week. Let's plus it as Walt Disney would do. And then you put more gas on it, more gas on it. Now those three, two dances are over 500 million collective views. Yes, we're at 5.5 million followers, four and a half more than any major league team. And what's crazy is we just launched our social media for our second team, the party animals, which they would call the Washington generals of the globe trotters, except the party animals actually win. Yeah. They've actually won more games than the bananas, which is crazy. Right. They're over 550,000 followers in just six weeks. And they're about to pass all the major league teams because we're very clear on what makes us different. And we are testing every day, trying new things, learning and putting it out and learning from that. So many people are worried about, oh, what if this doesn't work? If it's following your brand on who you are, maybe it's not going to hit, but you're going to learn something from it. the next day. You get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little better. So obvious, but that's really what's helped us tremendously. Jesse, we've mentioned a couple of times in this podcast that I was honored to get a chance to write this book with you. I even got the honor of writing the forward to be able to tell people how you've become special for me. Is there something out of this book process that really stands out to you that might be encouraging to others to go out and make sure they get a copy? <laughs> well, you know me, I never like to try to sell or promote. I like to share the experience and what it's about. And if it makes a difference for them, then that's a win. This book to me was a journey. Hmm. It was the first time really the full journey was shared from upbringing to where it is now. You have to uncover the journey. You have to find it, find the lessons through it. I really enjoyed this journey with you because we took from where it was basically from a one city world tour to where it is now. And in that chapter of time, and then said, okay, here it is, but now let's go back and say, how do we get there for any entrepreneur, any business owner, any, any business can follow that journey and then see this really snapshot in time to say, okay, this is where it's all coming together. And this is how I can put this with my business. It was just a lot of fun, Don. I'm just so honored to be able to capture this moment and the journey to get here because it was something that's not only changed my life, but fortunately has changed a lot of people's lives. And I'm so glad it can be shared. Jesse, how best can guests connect with you? I spend most of my time on LinkedIn from a social platform and storytelling. I've written every single post on LinkedIn. I started six years ago and those lessons that I've learned, that's where I connect with a lot of people and I'm sharing the journey. That's what it's all about. I would have done anything to be able to follow Walt Disney's journey, drawing Mickey Mouse, the animations, to doing the voice of Mickey, then firing himself, then creating the movies, then creating just the actual steps that what went to this decision? What happened here? What happened here? I'm trying to do that. So, you know, maybe in a few years, it can really help some people and share that, hey, there are challenges, there's adversity every step of the way. But if you have the persistence and belief in what you're doing, it's pretty magical what can happen. It threw the Bessie. To get to the good. <laughs> Jesse Cole, you are absolutely one of my all-time favorites. As someone I have been honored to work with in today interview, today, thank you for being with us, a corporate competitor. I appreciate you, Don, as always. Wow. For a second interview with somebody, I hope you found so much new and creative content in Jesse Cole, because I do. Every time I talk to Jesse Cole, I learn something. We made reference in the podcast to a conversation Jesse and I had in the bowels of a stadium in Montgomery, Alabama, just an hour before they were getting ready to play a game. 
earlier that day, the publisher of the book had actually suggested that what we really needed in the book was a little bit of a love story. And Jesse gave me this like, ah, oh, are you kidding me? Love story? Really? I looked at him and I said, you know what? I think I know what the love story is. I had the previous week stood next to his father and I watched his father look at Jesse with this amazing, just passion in his eyes as Jesse was interacting with fans and just realizing how much love his father had for what Jesse was being able to do for others now through baseball. That was the love story, like feel the dreams. And Jesse got tears in his eyes, like, wow, I'm not sure I can go there, but he did. And I think it actually makes for one of the greatest opening chapters of a book I've ever had a chance to write. I'm going to try to give you three takeaways from today. And that's really hard because there were so many for me. But the first one was when he talked about his father. At heart, I'm still a kid just trying to make my dad proud. And Jesse's realization of that, being able to kind of explain that to others, it connects him to his purpose. When you're connected back to your purpose and what really drives you, it is far more impactful, far more rich than whatever you get paid to do what you do or whatever title they give you for doing it. Being connected to your true driver is key. It's key to Jesse's success and key to ours. The second one was you have to get through the messy to get to the great. And he talked about all the different places where messy has been real within the Savannah Bananas journey. He talked about the fact that they currently track trick plays for their players. And he looked at his players and said, they won't remember if you miss a great trick play, but they'll never forget you if you make it. What a great inspiration. What a great idea for us. Try your version of a trick play, whatever that might be. Do it so that you can be great. And lastly, I love this idea of doing a friction audit, calling your business, park in your parking lot, look for what's there. What are the things that are friction points for those who look to do business with you? Submit a contact form on your website. Leaders need to be friction fighters. Jesse, I can't wait for this book to continue to do great. I'm also excited for the opportunities that will grow for you as you continue as a corporate competitor. If these lessons resonated with you, connect with me and my team at maxwellleadership.com slash Don. And together, let's next level your company culture. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager, who did that uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K. How you doing? Hey, Don. How you doing, my man? Great, sir. How are what you? they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399, but for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.